are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the ELECT webinar on Acquisitions Work from Competencies to Competence. I'm Erin Elzey, a member of the ELECT Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Lindsay Kronk and Rachel Fleming. Lindsay is Head of Collection Strategies at the University of Rochester, where she is responsible for developing and executing high-level collection strategies that include consortial collaborations, budget forecasting and management, and scholarly communications advocacy, while managing the practical matters of daily collection development and acquisitions work. Lindsay has presented and published on topics including data visualization for collection assessment, vendor partnership management, and feminist leadership. Rachel works on affordable course materials, scholarly communication, and collection assessment as Collections Initiatives Librarian at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. She has over 10 years of experience in library technical services, including collection development, collection management, serials, and acquisitions. Fleming's research interests center around the effective aspects of library technical services, including intralibrary communication, development of professional identity, and leadership skills. Lindsay and Rachel bring much expertise to today's topic, and we are fortunate to have them with us. A few logistics for our presentation today. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on the presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is A-L-C-T-S-C-E. You'll also see it there in bold on your screen right now. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for Lindsay and Rachel, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar screen. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, but you can enter your question at any time. The webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now we'll turn it over to Lindsay and Rachel. Note that there will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Okay. Oops. So, uh, can I confirm that you're all seeing the presentation there we now? Do. Fantastic. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our webinar. I'm Lindsay Kronk, Head of Collection Strategies at the University of Rochester. I want to thank Aaron for the introduction and the Alex Continuing Education Committee for inviting us. And I'm Rachel Fleming. I'm Collections Initiatives Librarian at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And I also want to thank you all for um, attending the webinar. I'm really excited to be having this conversation and I do mean a conversation. Lindsay and I are going to be having a back and forth throughout the session and we'll have some polls to get you involved in well and hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. So let's get started. I like agendas. Agendas are awesome. <laughs> What's on the agenda for today, Lindsay? Well, I like to think that it's pretty simple. We're going to give an overview of the core competencies for acquisitions librarians, and then we're going to talk about developing training plans based on those core competencies. As they say in the biz, all thriller, no filler. I think that's pretty reasonable. Sorry, guys. We also have some gifts um, that I'm hoping are going to support your work and identify your training needs, and we hope you will apply uh, what you're going to talk about today in that that work that comes ahead. If you're a visual thinker like me, I bet you'll love the core competencies at a glance. I've got them pinned up in my office even. All right, so getting started, we're going to start out with a poll to learn a little bit about each other. Um, so we're going to be getting that first poll up. Awesome. Um, and let us know what your role is in acquisitions. Um, if you're just an individual, if you're part of a team, or if you are in control of the team. And I want to let you know that Lindsay and I really believe that training is about people, and we take a people-first approach to training and to this webinar. So we want to get, get to know who you are um, before we go on any further. Rachel, can you talk a little bit about your background in acquisitions work while we ask people about their roles in acquisitions work? Well, my duties have changed a little bit since I've taken on this broader role at UTC, but I've always worked in acquisitions and collection management, even 
when I was a student worker. So I've been in the back of the library for over 15 years. Right, but tell me this. When you started at your first professional position, did you know how to be an acquisitions librarian? I had no idea how to be an acquisitions librarian when I started. I had some coursework that really kind of helped a little bit, um, but I just really remember walking into my first professional job and they showed me to my office and they were like, okay, so now you're in charge of selecting and purchasing everything that <laughs> this library gets. Uh, see you later. <laughs> and I just sat there like, I'm supposed to do what? How? Um, I had no idea what I was doing, but Lindsay, you knew everything when you started because you worked in a consortium, didn't you? So you knew everything when you became a librarian. You all can't see me rolling my eyes so hard, but absolutely not. And I made very visible mistakes just all the time. I thought SpringShare had to be associated with Springer. I called OCLC, OLCL on my curriculum vitae. I still can't keep track of which counter report is which. Apologies to Oliver and Athena. I have tried, but now I have stopped trying and I have just committed to internet searching for the most recent PowerPoint on the topic. I really had thought you had it all think, figured out, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not just me? Uh, it's quite the opposite, I suspect. <laughs> all right, we got almost everyone voted in this poll, so let's start to get up those results. You know, when we were preparing this uh, webinar, I got to thinking about what does it mean to have expertise in training? And I really think that everyone is or can be an expert in training. Everyone's received training, and had good and bad experiences in those training, you know, uh, in those training experiences. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, it's the only real difference, right, is that there's time for reflection or there isn't, and time is so hard to find, am I right? And some additional experience definitely helps too. And we can all take some time for reflection to improve our practices. Yeah, and every situation is unique, so there can't be a, a one-size-fit-all solution for what good training is. There's not like, oh, here's the greatest training and you just apply it in every situation. And you, uh, listeners are the experts in your local context. So you have that expertise above anyone who says that they're an expert in training. So let's look at what we've got uh, here in our audience. I'm excited to take a look. See it, Lindsay? Unfortunately, I cannot. Oh, well, let me tell you about it. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, so about half of our audience are part of a team and a third, if you can add those together using um, very serious math, are managers. Um, we've got a few others who are coordinators or solo librarians. So I'm excited, 50%, uh, you know, really um, part of the team and a good chunk of managers as well. That's a fun distribution. So let's get on back to our slides. Hey, we're really glad you're here. It's wonderful to have the chance to meet all of you to learn a little bit more of where you're coming from. Hello and welcome. Uh, I think it's fair to assume that you have many demands that are made of your time and we're just so grateful that you're here with us today. As we mentioned before, we think that making time is a crucial part of what we wanna talk about and why we are joining you today. But the time, the time's important and time is requisite actually. The main lesson for today is that we individually and collectively need to more proactively and mindfully address training. And we hope to give you some tools to do that. Well, not so much tools um, as a kind of a process to what you need to spend time doing. Rachel and I have had a lot of formal and informal conversations with acquisitions workers and technical service workers generally that our experiences, what we've described to you, that sense of uh, being left to handle everything that a library buys without much preparation are par for the course. So to really put a fine point on it, workers, when they come into new jobs, they don't feel adequately prepared um, for their positions. New workers, new workers really struggle to find the time, support, and training resources to get themselves prepared. They feel isolated, 
and unsupported and they feel like it's all on them to figure out what to do about it. They don't know what to ask or who to ask um, and they don't feel like they're um, that they're able to admit that they don't feel prepared. That's really not helped right by the overwhelming range of things we're expected to do in our line of work and that piece where we're always putting out fires. It takes time and intentionality to be prepared. Uh, we have to have full gauges in each of these areas. We have to have the time, the institutional support, and the energy. Some of these gauges are inside of our control, but others aren't. Absolutely. And I also want to mention here that we're not saying that there's no training available, that nobody learned anything in library school. This is just kind of reporting the facts from what we hear. Um, from those formal in, informal conversations, how people feel when they get to their positions. Um, and on that note, we're going to get our next poll up. Let's do it. This next poll is how prepared were you or did you feel when you started working? Um, a little prepared, totally with it, or somewhere in between? And while you're answering that, um, the, it's true that workers who change positions or become department heads like me, we still struggle with this. It's not just when we start our positions. Yeah, I got this new position. I'm really struggling to find time to train myself up on scholarly communications and copyright issues that are new areas for me. Those are naughty issues. K-N-O-T-T-Y. I'm working on criteria personally for acquisitions frameworks for non-traditional scholarship, things that may not have been considered scholarship in the past that we're trying to encompass into our processes. Um, and we're finding new challenges every day. Uh, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to keep up with. Yeah, and new professionals though, they really have the hardest struggle because they're learning for the first time how to operate in a professional culture and in an institutional culture all while struggling to complete their training. So we've got almost everyone voted, maybe like five more seconds. All right, let's take a look at these results. Uh, can you see the results, Lindsay? I unfortunately cannot. Could you describe them to well, me? Well, I want you to guess. Um, how many uh, folks do you say, think said not at all prepared? I would say that the overwhelming majority did. Well, it's kind of mixed. So we've got 36% said not at all prepared and 42% said somewhat prepared, oh. leaving just over 10% saying they felt either prepared or totally prepared. That's so really good distribution. 90% of folks saying, no, I'm not prepared for my new position. So um, I think we're going to get back to our slides. Let's do it. So one of the great resources that are out there are core competencies. These are available from several types of um, organizations. Alex has some, NASIG, ACRL, ALA, and I'm sure there's more um, that I'm not mentioning. We're gonna focus on core competencies for acquisitions professionals, because Lindsay and I are acquisitions professionals. Extremely professional. <laughs> We're going to start with the core competencies and work through how we can create some great training programs and create great library workers. And again, we're really focused on giving you tools to use for that process. Uh, you should remember that membership associations like OX are great places to talk with each other about what, what's working and what is it. All right, so just some background on the core competencies for acquisitions professionals. It's a document that was created by the Education Committee of the Acquisitions Section of ELEX and approved by the ELEX Board of Directors in May 2018. The drafters conducted this systematic review of job ads over 18 months, I think, about every job ad that had acquisition related um, duties in it. And after assembling all that into a draft of the competencies, they got input from acquisitions workers that helped uh, shape that final document. And we're so grateful for the hard work of all the volunteers who created this extremely poor, thorough document. Um, it's really, really something. And whenever you look at a core competencies document, it's clear just how much work, how many hands touched it, um, right? And we wanna shout out the members of the committee who drafted it and anyone who had a chance to give feedback 
on those early drafts. In case you haven't had a chance to really dive into the core competencies document, we're going to give you a brief tour. But first, we're going to ask you um, one more question and get our third poll up. Um, really? We love so we want to we want to have individual conversations with all of you. So we want to know how familiar you are, you are with the core competencies. Um, you're not at all familiar. You've kind of glanced through them. You've applied them maybe in drafting a job ad, or maybe you're of uh, somebody who was on that list that we just put up on our slide. So let us know. Oh, so Lindsay, you were mentioning that it's clear how much work goes into creating core competencies documents. And when I glance through the core competencies, I'm reminded um, of what one of my history professors used to say. Um, she would call these incredibly fact-filled. Um, <laughs> there's just so much in there. It, it contains everything that we think can be in an acquisition role. And it's all good stuff, but it's really dense and really daunting. You said it, friend, it's fact rich. Um, and I'm really interested to hear how familiar folks are with the core competencies. Well, let's get these results up. So um, two thirds of our audience are not familiar and a third are familiar. And we've got maybe one or two folks who have uh, used them and applied them. So we can head on back to our slides. So no one, no one's in the audience that wrote this thing? No. It's all right. <laughs> so I think, yeah. So let's break it down. There's um, three main areas in the acquisitions core competencies, knowledge, skills and ability, and behavioral competencies. Just taking it back for you all. These areas work together and they also build on each other. We all know that knowledge is useful for contextualizing skills and sometimes grounding the how of what we do and the why of how we do it, right? Um, for some skills, knowledge is even a prerequisite. You can't approach it without knowing how and why. For many uh, considerations of what we call behavioral or attribute competencies, it's really helpful to have a firm and solid foundation in the knowledge and skills that come before. All right, now we're going to skip back to uh, knowledge competencies. So knowledge competencies are just that things like concrete things that you can know, um, like uh, specific systems and standards. I think like what is Mark? Uh, what is Sushi? It's not what you think it is, right? No, it's not delicious. Sadly. If only. Um, examples of this include the sort of working bibliographic knowledge. Uh, I may not know every field of mark, but I know specifically that a 583 field can be used to describe a preservation action, which is crucial to my work in shared print, right? Distributed print repositories. From the marketplace vendor side, which is where I spend a great deal of my time as an acquisitions professional, it really helps to know that Gale and ProQuest have competitive and overlapping online archival resources. It helps to know that Adam Matthew is part of SAGE. From a system side, when a dean or director talks to you about wanting to get a next-gen ILS, it's helpful to know that you have limited options. From a resource review side, as I mentioned before about my beloved counter standards, I'm aware that they're always going to be updated. Yeah, so those are the knowledge competencies in those uh, four main areas. Uh, what is next? Skills and ability. You have these skills and abilities competencies. So how are these different than knowledges? This is what one of the things that first tripped me up with the core competencies. I, I totally understand, but it's more about applying knowledge or as I put up here, synthesizing principles and techniques. Uh, it's about creating workflows and managing the work that we actually do. Oh yeah, so like uh, the knowledge competencies, we see a lot of understand in the skills. And then in, in these abilities, we see a lot of apply or design. So that might ring a bell for some fans of Bloom's Taxonomy. I don't know uh, how many Bloom's Taxonomy fans we've got in the audience. I feel like we'd see a strong distribution if we were to attempt another poll. But <laughs> practical examples of how we might apply skills would be, again, if that 583 note, I know that I can use it to note my retention commitments. It makes it easier for folks 
on the ground looking at weeding projects to know, oh, I looked there, right? The, the, the Hadi Trust node is there. So I've applied that, right? It means applying that knowledge that I mentioned of overlapping vendor portfolios to negotiate better terms between competitors. Uh, if I can say to my Adam Matthew rep, I spent XYZ with Sage, right, and, and save my institution money, I'm proving value and I'm applying my knowledge. And it might be something as simple as learning enough about Excel to use pivot tables and projection techniques to make drafting that budget a little bit easier over time. Awesome. Um, so the final area of competencies are behavioral competencies attributes that contribute to success. So if you've ever applied for a job, or written to a job ad, you kind of know what's addressed here, like strong communication skills. You can't see me making air quotes. Um, uh, but I have to say that the competencies do this really great job of demonstrating exactly how these behaviors apply in day-to-day -day work. Um, like, as I would recommend them for somebody applying to a job, to read through the behavioral competencies so they know what to talk about when they talk about communication skills. I think that that's such a good point, Rachel. And examples around behavioral competencies might mean creating space and time to keep up with your vendor contacts beyond those sales pitches and renewals, to develop the relationships that are going to help you um, through communication and cooperation, right? Uh, it might mean considering how acquisitions practices you have in place, like only using a single platform to make monographic acquisitions will inevitably limit your potential to diversify collections, right? Uh, applying professional integrity, thinking about diversity and inclusion in the practice itself. Right. All of these things require a lot of planning and intentionality, which means, which as we mentioned, it's really challenging. Um, unless you really create the time and space for yourself and other staff who work with you to consider approaches in a way that is mindful and intentional. So those three are the main three areas of the core competencies. So that's our high speed tour of the competencies. Um, but you want to you want to be careful uh, that you look at a whole position not just what is included in these acquisitions competencies. Right. I know for myself, I've had to take a look at those NASIC core competencies for e-resources on more than one occasion. Or a position might have, say, uh, shared reference or liaison duties that you want to account for um, in the competencies that are applied. The competencies are there to help you identify specific needs to the position and to clearly articulate them. Yeah, and you can also think of a competency not just as an on or off switch, but you can think about the depth of knowledge required in each of those competency areas and how they build on each other. So to use some examples from my life, do I need to know about how record loading works? Because catalogers are going to set it up, but I need to know how the workflow works. So just focus on that skill and ability competence. Or do I need more of the knowledge competence because I'm going to be creating and maintaining the record loaders as well as setting up the workflows? It's that sort of holistic understanding. You're making an excellent point, Rachel. And in our research, you know that we found that one area where folks really felt they lacked um, what they needed when they started in new positions was institutional knowledge and culture. So that's something you want to make sure to include, even if it's challenging to articulate. Remember, no new person knows what they need to know. Uh, it's impossible for them to know unless this is brought up and clarified sooner than later. Absolutely. And what you can do is take, um, take the time to set your people up for success by laying the orientation and training out there instead of assuming that new staff are going to be able to ask for what they need. Um, and it isn't just acquisitions and technical services workers who feel like orientation to institutional culture and politics is really lacking is across library positions and probably every job everywhere. It takes at least six months and probably more like a year or two to get acclimated to an institutional culture. Yeah, I always say you're new for two years. Um, and it's especially important for acquisitions librarians to get a background on institutional knowledge and culture because we interact with a number of other departments, finance, contracts, I talk to bookstore, I might talk to students. Um, talk to council. Council, oh my goodness. Um, 
and the, the acquisition can be the face of the library to those departments. So we want to make sure that the training is really on point. Um, and so on that point, you know, the institutional culture training probably needs to be more robust than any kind of new librarian mentor program that you've got at your institution. You really want to pay attention to exactly how somebody is going to need to get acculturated. And just to quickly add on to that, I think that there's really huge potential for us as a profession to address this more directly in a way that will help us with retention outcomes and talent management. Absolutely. So that's the competencies. Uh, what do we do with them? Well, there's so much in there. Uh, the thing I think about when I think about these competencies is that there's a whole universe of things to know. Um, and the first step is to define what you need right now, right? To prioritize. Right. So if you've recently crafted a job ad, you probably used or you could have used the competencies, um, but you could also use them to define a current position in general, at least in academia. We have a terrible problem of professional positions not having any specific <laughs> duties. So people coming into those new positions aren't really quite sure what they need to know. Um, so that competencies can really help in that um, circumstance. You could even look at a whole acquisitions department. What needs to happen sooner or what is prerequisite for your team to advance a, a, to a systems migration or through a big move? Um, think about prioritizing not just for your individual professional development, but, but across the organization or in your unit. Um, it's an opportunity that if we dress it intentionally has almost unlimited potential to help improve our organizational outcomes. Yeah, there's this really great example of applying competencies to a whole department. I saw at the uh, 2018 ALA midwinter meeting, the folks at Utah State University in their cataloging department had a, uh, a reduction in staff and they used the core competencies for cataloging and metadata professionals for all of their professional staff and they kind of looked at what they knew and what they needed to know and developed a whole plan for how to meet their new needs. Let me just drop a link to those slides in the chat. And again, first of all, that presentation is lit and that approach is amazing, but you can also individually look at where you'd like to be professionally and make like a map to your future self. Like a, like a five-year plan for your own uh, professional development um, that's even maybe outside of what your current job is like where do I want to go um, where am I you determine every competency yeah. you need for your professional development yeah so that's what we're gonna do we're just gonna take some time probably a lot of time and determine what we need for our professional development goals and the depth of what we need uh, it sounds simple and it is simple, but it takes a ton of time. And that's what we mean by approaching training more proactively and mindfully. And the work to fully define a position, your position personally, a position you're advertising or a position you wanna be in in a few years, all of that defining is going to be beneficial in a lot of ways. Considering that a newer professional will need more training to obtain competencies has absolutely informed the way I draft positions and support training across portfolios in my library. And you guys, this is where I'm going to take a, a drink of water and I encourage you to do so too, because everyone has to stay hydrated <laughs> is another crucial element of conducting webinars and also making training um, and coming to a point of professional direction and success. But once you've hydrated, mapped your needs, and you've got a picture of what is needed, what the ideal or goal is, that position that five years out, you want to be qualified, you want to have every competency to meet it, that's when you can take a close look at where you are. Exactly. To a bit, use a bit of business talk, you want to conduct a gap analysis. Gap analysis step one is to identify gaps. Um, and those are the gaps between where you are and where you need to be. So we've already um, figured out where we want to be. And so we just figure out where we are and look at where those gaps are. So, you know, you might have guessed that it's pretty easy to see how you might apply a gap analysis to a knowledge competency. But for the other competencies, it's important to unbusiness this idea. 
um, it's, it's not enough to just think about knowledge. I mean, think about knowledge a lot in libraries. Excuse me. Absolutely. When we ask acquisitions professionals about their training, one of the things they talk about repeatedly is how um, how they feel uncomfortable with what they perceive is expected of them, especially about finance duties. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're supposed to be um, right from the get go, uh, kind of all knowing expert. And so going through and really identifying the expectations from those competencies can dispel some of this problem. You can say, this is what I need you to know exactly. And we expect you to have or to obtain these skills and abilities. And here's what we expect um, as far as your behaviors go. And together you can work out a plan to get to that level of competency. Um, you can do the same with general knowledge about institutional politics and institutional processes. It's a great way to demystify it, right? And that's why covering things that can on the surface appear more nebulous, those things like confidence and expectations, institutional history, institutional politics is the kind of thing that you wanna make sure you account for um, because it really is one of those things that can help new professionals succeed. And again, even from the point of view of someone who entered a department head role recently from mid-management, I would say expectations coming into this were even higher that I would just know, right? And I, I think that there's a reason behind that, right? But that reason, again, is about not mindfully as organizations maybe taking the time to create uh, onboarding that holistically addresses these things. Right. So like an example from my life. So take local financial practices. You can look at my CV and you can know that you can count on me if I came to a position in your library that I would know how invoicing and payment works generally. But how would I know how invoicing and payment works at <laughs> this new position? I only know how it works generally. There's a really kind of a big gap there but it's one that's really easy to close when you pay attention and say like, you know, don't leave it in my hands to know the right questions and how things are doing, but to say like, let's sit down with the staff member, let's sit down with the controllers department and really go over how things are done here. I think that it's, it's an efficiency question, right? Rachel's example is a terrific example of the fact that the systems we use for finance, um, they're similar, but they're often different. The standards that are in place and the institutional practices for that documentation are, are different. Uh, just a little bit of local knowledge can really save a lot of confusion and hassle as someone gets started. I have a mentor who always says that you will spend the time up front or you will spend the time cleaning up. Uh, regardless of how you do it, the time is going to be spent. What if instead of creating a, a bumper zone of time where we expected people to make mistakes. We set them up for success. Yeah, and think about that new um, employee coming in and how they're going to feel supported in an organization that takes the time to organize and identify some of these basics of training. When you put that thoughtfulness into an onboarding program, and it's really welcoming. And again, think of how this might positively affect retention outcomes. Uh, you know, there was recently a, a study that was published on morale in libraries, and I was thinking about it just today, right, Rachel? And I was thinking about how much of that has to do with the ambiguity and confusion that could be um, allayed through the development of, you know, proactive communication, direct communication about some of this stuff, thinking about onboarding in that way. Absolutely. So we've got this picture of, of where we want to be, which P.S. Kudos, I, I salute every person who has a very clear sense of that. Where we are now, too, um, and now we've, we've got the gaps. They've been identified. So we're on to gap analysis step two, identifying how to close those gaps. Aha, finally, the training. No, 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 not, not yet. I've got one more thing I want to talk about. Uh, all these people want to talk about the training, Rachel. Well, I want to talk about one more thing, so we're going to. Um, What's the last thing we need to consider? Well, I, and maybe it's because I'm like this, um, but I think it really will do a world of difference for a trainee and a supervisor to get together and consider not just what kind of training resources we need, but what kind. So what kind of training works best for the trainee to close the gaps? And it might 
vary from gap to gap. That's so true and it's great that you bring that up because when we talked to acquisitions professionals, they talked about how sometimes they wanted to do a job shadowing or in other cases, they preferred a printed resource. Um, in some cases, they wanted a classroom or coursework, like one of those excellent Alexa Fundamentals courses, say, or even a webinar. Right, so when you're working with your department or your individual programs, really think about what would be the most effective way for this individual person to receive training in the things that they specifically need training. So I like to just dive in and I want like a lot of help documentation or examples to work through, but maybe somebody else might really prefer to attend a webinar walkthrough. Or maybe if the both of us are in the same department and we both need training, um, you can give me time to just dive in and then let me learn my actual favorite way, which is to teach them how to do it. So that's a true story about Alma Analytics. <laughs> And it's so funny, Rachel, like I think of you every time I confront a challenge in all my analytics, actually. <laughs> just uh, just dive in. That's what I do. Um, but it's definitely not for everyone. Um, <laughs> so now we're ready to look at those training opportunities. Ideally, we're able to find training opportunities and reference materials in the preferred formats, but they might not exist. Um, so other formats might have to do for the time being. The core competencies document even talks about the difficulty in finding some trainings, which I think is so brave and transparent and cool of it. It says, and I quote, lack of professional training opportunities is a significant challenge in the field, with many acquisitions professionals learning locally developed practices on the job and through continuing education offerings by professional associations. Part of today, Right. Part of what we're talking about today is pushing for organizations and individuals to help us and others identify and develop those greater gaps where formats of training should be to help build capacity across the profession. Because when we're talking about, again, quotation fingers, learning locally developed practices, in some ways we're talking about a failure of, of, of efficiency, right, and sharing in a profession that focuses a lot on sharing. Right. Right. So after we've identified training opportunities that do exist and made the plans, we have to also remember to be sure to allow for the training to occur. <laughs> um, time for study and practice. And then um, to be sure to close that loop. When and how are you going to reassess the gaps and check in with how much progress has been made? And that can be made um, part of something like an annual evaluation or a work plan. So now we can talk about organizational efficiency, because as I alluded to before, none of us is an island um, and we're all part of a, a larger organization, a larger department and at your library and beyond that, there's the whole world that we kind of have to think about a little bit when we approach this. Yeah, we really need to assert the importance of preparing our workforce, of preparing each other, advocating for the, you know, folks who are coming after us or our peers to our administrators. Um, and that requires uh, intentionally addressing uh, the skills that we've identified in the competencies for the profession. Yeah, I firmly believe that the documentation speaks for itself. You have heard me say time and time again, what a fan of this document I am, but it, it simply won't be read if you don't put it in front of your deans, directors and bosses. We need to be saying that our work is valuable if um, we want this to be improved. Um, and that will help support positive outcomes for both those micro and macro scales we're talking about. And that's the really beautiful thing about going through all of this trouble to design a training plan. Not only does it provide this really personal and caring model of professional development, which is its own end, but together we can do this communal good of identifying what is missing in what formats from the training landscape. So, you know, this training, I couldn't find anything in this format that my staff member wants. So we could share that gap with um, an appropriate LX um, section committee or the LX CE committee or elsewhere. And then our collective gap analyses will show the need and demand for these new resources to be created. And then we can, as a community, create those resources for each other. And 
this is my drum that I beat, but demonstrating demand is really important because, listen, friends, we really believe that going through the process, the process we've described, will help create different kinds of acquisitions professionals that we'll be proud to work with and the training out resources to support all of us. Libraries are often called a niche community, and it's true. I do think everyone knows basically everyone, two to three people out. We owe it to each other to integrate these competencies as standards into our work. In places where there isn't training available, we need to raise our hands and ask for it. So we've got everything in place um, to get going on our master plan to develop robust training plans at your institution and for all of acquisitions librarianship. But the thing is, we can't create resources without resources. Good one, Rachel. Thank you. It's true, and we're asking for a lot here. Yeah, so first, <clears throat> excuse me, we've asked you to do a lot, um, if you've been taking careful notes. Um, we've asked you to do a lot that will take a lot of time. Um, not only to do the work, but also to have conversations uh, with with each other. So the process we've laid out here is to identify the competencies in the position, identify the skills the worker have, identify the gaps, identify the training opportunities, and then complete the training. So each of those steps really involves a lot of discussions as well. And that time really adds up and none of it, as much as we are magic in the back of the library, uh, none of it happens by magic. It all takes hard work. And time means money. And in addition to the time you need, well, money for the books, for the continuing education courses, or on a larger scale, for us to work together to develop new resources. Right. I mean, it's all well and good to have a personal commitment to training yourself and your staff, but we really can't rely on it to get the job done at the end of the day. You need institutional support. I'm looking at all of you um, in the audience who I saw have like director by your names. Uh, we need institutional support to really make it happen. Don't you know it? So to get local resources, we need to connect to uh, strategic goals, annual evaluations and time allocations. In my mind, all of this is data and it's harder to put together on when we're assuming that the person we've hired knows everything that they need to know, has the skills that we'd prefer, and instead of thinking holistically about how to construct a workforce capable of addressing that whole galaxy of possibility in this professional area that we've outlined in the core competencies, we're just saying, go do it. Right, but on the other hand, when you go through this whole process, you've already got a strong rationale for um, advocating for your resources. You've got, here are the specific gaps we're going to address, Here's a method we're going to address those gap, gaps, and here are the time, and here's the time that we need to complete that training. And you can work all of that in, um, all that time into work plans, like I mentioned. And actually, it might be a little bit easier um, for staff level than professionals because staff tend to have clear job responsibilities and maybe time allocations. So you can identify a percentage of time to training, and then um, identify during the uh, identify specific training for each annual cycle, and then it, if necessary, even reduce other expectations to allow time. Mm -hmm. you know, think about RDA or think about all these big um, system migrations. So you might have to reduce other expectations to make sure folks have the training that they need. Um, for professional staff, there are still usual, usually annual reviews. So you can work goals in as well, keeping in mind that, you know, you're not, really going to be able to close all the gaps in a single cycle and that it takes time and you might have to adjust other responsibilities. Professional development happens throughout the career, not just at the beginning. So um, for individuals, you can tap into those annual review cycles, but don't forget to identify professional development and specific training goals as priorities at the institutional level. Where does training and development fit in your strategic plan and your operational mm -hmm. plan? And what other tools um, can you use to show that training is a priority in your institution um, and in line with your other institutional priorities? And now is where I take a drink of water and stay hydrated. So crucial. And it's just, we talked about preparedness earlier in the cycle. In libraries, we're constantly being expected, right, to transform and adopt new things. 
we think about preparedness at that institutional level and training is the tool that makes us more prepared, we're, we're all going to be in a stronger position. And so now if you let me talk a little bit while you're taking that drink, Rachel, about many resources to training. Sometimes, and I, I don't mean in every case, but sometimes there seems to be a reticence about training employees by organizations. For whatever reason, organizations can feel like they're investing maybe in an individual who will just take that training, those skills, those knowledges, those all those wonderful things away with them, and that it will no longer benefit our specific organization. In some cases, this is a barrier to training. But I really want to encourage everyone to resist thinking like this, because as I mentioned before, when we invest in the training of acquisitions professionals, it is to the benefit, it is to our benefit even if those professionals leave our local organizations. The more well-trained acquisitions professionals we have out there, the better it is for everyone, the more prepared every organization is. And organizations specifically have a real responsibility to provide support to their employees to meet the standards that we have set. It's us, right? The, the slide I threw up, um, those are all folks we know. We came together and we informed these competencies. It's our job to uphold them. Absolutely. You can't expect folks to meet the expectations you set for them if you don't provide adequate tools and support. Or, I mean, you can, um, but it's wrong, and that's why the slide says moral imperative. Um, we can't go around saying, we can't go around saying, oh, nobody, nobody's qualified, nobody has the right skills, and expect staff themselves to somehow, you know, get this training from somewhere that doesn't have an effect on our institutions. Um, again, you could, but it's wrong. <laughs> so we, we want to advocate for each other and the, the upcoming staff um, and say that this training is important and the time to do it is all of the time. And it's something that our institutions need to be supporting. Here, here. So, yeah. So we want to leave as much time as we can for questions. Um, and that's pretty much all we want to share with you, except for a few closing thoughts. First, we thought since we've walked you through such a long process, it would be handy for you to have a couple of takeaway tools to use in your local context. You will receive or may have already received a couple of PDF infographics that should help you apply the process we've walked through today, whether as an individual or as a department, as an organization. I hope you enjoy them and find them useful. It's always easier to approach even what is a, a straightforward but very ambitious process like competency and capacity mapping with a worksheet or in this case a map uh, in hand. And if you do use these tools, we'd love to know. We'd, we'd love to hear about what you do next and what you know now um, after working through the process. And what is missing in terms of, again, of the training, the documentation, the formats that can help us all arrive at a more prepared place. Yeah. Go ahead and move this slide. Yeah, so thank you for your time and attention and energy today. Um, we really appreciate um, your coming to listen and consider uh, what we're sharing. And this is just a final reminder to really keep an eye on those gauges. Time, support, and energy are all key to avoiding burnout and staying on top of our games. It takes time. It takes the time to build the relationships, the time to imagine and dream and grow, confront the transformations that we're all undertaking. And the time to think about work without being it being a worry or an anxious feeling or a sense of being unconfident or unprepared is perhaps the single best thing we can do for our organizations and ourselves. All right, so we're going to hand it back over to Erin to moderate questions. All right, thank you to you both. This has been really great so far. Um, as Rachel Lindsay said, we do have plenty of time now left for questions. Uh, you can go ahead and type them into your question box on the GoToWebinar panel that you have. And we do have a few that have come in so far, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, the first one is a little broad. Uh, what do you recommend for someone who's really wanting to get into technical services? Do you have knowledge that you find crucial to be appealing for those roles? I'm a huge fan of the Alex 
what are they called, Rachel? Like, yeah, yoga like the fundamentals the classes. The fundamentals classes are just yeah. extraordinary places to start. When I first got started in, um, or in an earlier slide, we alluded to the fact that you, you know, the acquisitions of core competencies are amazing. Right, but you have to in a lot of practitioner roles. Like, and I was in a more e-resources focused role. Um, it's it's about hitting more competencies, not fewer. So I attended the collection assessment fundamentals course, and it was one of the most transformative learning experiences of my career. Um, assessment has been, become a passion of mine, um, but it's just so crucial to a lot of the work that's happening throughout libraries. Um, and I think that. Um, any of those fundamentals courses I can imagine leading to those sort of aha and connecting moments. So I recommend those really highly. Yeah, those are kind of like an online course that's over several weeks. Um, another place where you might go if you've got the uh, ability to get to a conference, either at ALA or I know Charleston has pre-conferences that are like yes. a four hour or a eight hour day that are, you know, introduction to acquisitions for uh, just a whole day. boot camp even. Yeah, the boot camp. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is regarding those PDF graphics that Lindsay had mentioned um, and when and where you'll expect to receive them. You will have those along with the email that has the recording and the slides uh, for the presentation. So once we're finished editing anything we need to with the recording, we'll get that sent out. It's usually within a, the next couple of days. Um, I'm excited our, about them. <laughs> <laughs> our next question for the presenters is, it seemed like a lot of what you were saying was an arguing to the directors that may have been in the audience. What if we're a staff member? How do we argue to our own director for that mm. making time if our Absolutely. institution doesn't automatically support it? That's a really good point. Um, I think that the key is to start with what you're being asked. So, you know, you're asking me to do this skill that I might not be prepared for. So if you want me to do this at the level you're expecting, you need to also give me the background to do it to that level. And that's going to take some training. What do you think, Lindsay? You're the boss. I, I, uh, yeah, so I sit very squarely in the middle of my organization. So I definitely think that when I frame these, part of um, how I always think about it is how I would pitch it right, to my boss and to my administration. So I think probably uh, a bit of what we were, we were talking about here is that we need to be pitching the value of technical services and making technical services um, more visible piece. I, I know that's a passion for both of us, right? So the core competencies document, to my mind, is actually a really wonderful lever to pull. And I'm hopeful, too, that the, the infographics that we provided are, are additional sort of evidence that you can point to, data that you can point to, to say, hey, this has been acknowledged at the highest level of my professional organization to be the, the competencies that are required for the work that you have set in place for me. This is what it's going to take for me to be able to do that work to the, the caliber, the level of excellence that I know you want to see, right? Um, and it's a little bit to my mind, and, and forgive me, because uh, this is, again, something that I think about a lot. It's a little bit about um, owning the swagger of asking for help, right? Of asking for institutional support, saying, you want me to be the best at this that I can be. Like, let's invest in this and you'll see a return. You'll see, you'll see value. You will see an improved outcome for our organization. Yeah, so something like, I'm doing a good job already, but if you give me two hours a week to uh, work on this on my own, I'll be doing even better. Something like that is what you're thinking? Yeah, about? yeah. Or even um, if you give me two hours a week, I can make this process better. Then someday I'm going to be presenting on this process, right, and talking about how my institution is leading this effort. And people are going to know that our library is a leader in this area. Right. There's always there's always the opportunity to say that the visibility, right, and the value of your work is something that that matters and impacts people's views of your institution. Um, people's, you know, like it's again, it's a very small community, and having that ability to say now I'm collaborating with X Y Z institution 
to improve this process, right? Like I reached out to my colleagues at Harvard, right? Is one of my favorite things to say to my, my dean. She loves it, right? And that's that's a piece of, of again, um, the pitch for professional development as a benefit to all, right? That may not have been heard by your, your dean or director previously, whatever your position. And the other thing I wanna frankly acknowledge is that we're not all in positions of power where that's an easy ask, right? So. Um, Part of what we're talking about and trying to, to sort of bake into this process is the core competencies is a mean to talk about this that that doesn't make it doesn't over personalize it right or, or make it about um, that piece, which I know can be a little bit stressful. Yeah, one thing I, I think about as far as really accessible training as well. So, you know, no, not everyone has the, the wherewithal to go to ALA and go to a four hour pre-conference that takes a lot of money and a lot of time. And I want the training to be out there in a lot of different ways so that I can get maybe a recorded webinar that I'm playing in the background while I'm also doing other work, or I can have a printed document that you know I could be uh, glancing at whenever I need it. So asking um, professional organizations to make sure that those resources are out there is another part of uh, our agenda. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Great, more. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more. Um, the next one is, are you aware of any acquisitions mentoring programs? No, I know in the Alex um, mentoring program, they um, try to match you up with somebody in your same field. So um, the Alex has a formal mentoring program. Um, I think it starts in the, the spring of each year um, and they try and match up acquisitions people with acquisitions people. And, um, you know, again, through informal networks and please consider Rachel and I a part of your informal network, you know, as you've attended this webinar. Um, I'm always happy to try to connect folks um, with, with potential mentors. I know that having a mentor myself has been one of the, the parts that I, has made me feel a lot more prepared, right, in my, in my personal work. Um, I would also say that oftentimes if you attend a conference as a, as a first time attendee, if you're able to make that ask, there are often um, conference mentors that can lead you to, to have that, that relationship as well. You can ask to continue it. All right, great, thank you. So that is actually gonna wrap up all the time that we have for questions today. Um, so thank you to you both for all of your time. This has been a really great session. And thank you to all of our attendees. We're glad that you've been able to join us today. Um, you will soon receive a short online evaluation form. If you could take a few minutes to respond to those questions, your comments are very valuable and do help our continuing education committee plan future events. The email will also include the links to today's slide and recording, as well as those PDFs that Lindsay had mentioned. And you do have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance. You'll also find that information in the email. And once again, a big thank you to our presenters, Lindsay Cronk and Rachel Fleming. And thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Eva Sorrell and Tiffany Henry, and to Alana Warren from the ELECT office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. Alex does have future events coming up. We have a full fall, I'm sorry, full fall webinar season. The next webinar will be Wednesday, October 2nd on special collections cataloging for maps. Please see the Alex website to find more information or to register for these. And we also offer web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two day email discussions. Our next e-form will be on October 15th, discussing team building and technical services. Please check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Thanks to everyone for joining us today, and this will conclude our session.